welcome to Hoffman's Hunting Heritage. Load your quiver, camo up, and join us for another great episode of Outdoors Action. Here is your host, Bill Hoffman. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Hoffman's Hunting Heritage. I'm your host, Bill Hoffman, and on this week, I've got a guest. His name is Michael Turner of Whitetail Properties Real Estate. We're going to talk all about whitetail hunting, maybe get into some other type of stuff, but what he specializes in is pretty cool, and it's something that I think a lot of us dream about, and that is securing and owning our own hunting property. So, Michael, welcome to the show. How you doing, Bill? Good to be with you. Hey, I'm doing great. Just a public land hunter here, you know, rocking my quarter acre in a subdivision. Not too many deer running through here. <laughs> I've hunted my share of public land, I guarantee you that. Yeah, I, I it's a blessing. I actually live really close to a lot of um uh state land, public land that doesn't even get pressured very hardcore. And up north in the West Branch, Michigan area. Uh, we have a half an acre there surrounded by about 9,000 acres of state land. So I might not be your typical customer, but we all dream of owning whitetail property. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in the real estate game and what type of hunting you like to do and all that jazz. Well, Bill, first of all, let me touch on something. You actually are the typical customer. I Am I really? Okay. Yeah. You, you know, I deal with people who... Typically, you know, they're tired of hunting public land or they really just want to own something for themselves or for their family or their group of friends. And it's time for them to finally, you know, buy a piece of their of their dream. You know, it's normal guys like you and I, blue collar, white collar type of guys who are just looking to own, you know, that that dream. Yeah, that's really cool. I, you know. You always do that thing. Well, I don't know if you always do it, but I always do that thing where like you're driving down the highway and you see a big chunk and you just be like, man, what I would do with that. <laughs> I do all the time. And uh, trust me, I'm on some good pieces a lot and I'm just walking around in a daze. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 this might be a little bit off topic, but my wife always gets after me. When we take the kids to the zoo, I'm looking at ribs and shot placement. <laughs> that is a common thing that I say is, you know, somebody points out an anim animal to me and I might say a, a comment like, boy, that looks kind of tasty. Right. Exactly. I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm not even like too shy. I'll like actually like draw my, uh, my invisible bow back and like lock into my anchor and be like, oh yeah, he'd be mine. <laughs> well, it's in us. It's just in us. Hey, yeah, that's right. So anyway, tell me a little bit about your background. How'd you get into the outdoors? Well, first of all, I grew up in Northern Michigan. Um, so obviously I was kind of, I was hunting and fishing at an early age. I picked up a bow at the age of 12. We actually had it in gym class back in the day. And that first gym class, I was absolutely smitten. I begged my mom and dad for uh, a bow and I got one. I got a bear cub recurve that Christmas and man, I was, I was after it. I, I we happened to live on the outskirts of city and I would walk literally across the street onto this little piece. I had permission and uh, I would hunt all day long. My mom would worry about me. You know, of course, there are no cell phones then and come out there once in a while to check on me. And I, I was sitting there freezing my tail off, waiting for something to come in. Your, so, your, your story sounds kind of like mine, but with mine, there wasn't a, a songbird or a garter snake or a no. rabbit that was not getting an arrow flung at it. <laughs> That's right. Every, every, every chance you get, you're flinging it at something. I can't. I I missed so many grass grasshoppers. I just well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what happens, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Now, when you say uh, Northern Michigan, what, what what area? I grew up in the Gladwin area, Gladwin okay. Holton Lake. Yep. So uh, when you spoke about West Branch, I know it well. Yes, yes, you do. Yeah, we have a place in West Branch and in Mancelona, just south of Gaylord. So that whole area is a second home to me. Uh, that's awesome, man. And um, so uh, another thing that you and I have in common is a career in law enforcement. Not going to touch that too much, but I think you and I are blood brothers. 
we could be. <laughs> um, like you said, I, uh, how I got into this, I retired from law enforcement um, nearly three falls ago. And uh, I'd always looked at Whitetail Properties as being the premium uh, company to work for. You know, these guys were on TV everywhere. They were hunting all the time and, of course, showing properties. And I couldn't imagine uh, a better, at least second job for me, you know, going out there and looking at land. And, and land, um, I just have a huge passion for it. Not only is it, you know, something we can put our feet on and own, but it's much deeper than that. You know, it's it's the birds and the animals and the trees and the landscape. And it just... It's just kind of my life, my lifestyle. You know, it's the one thing that God's not making any more of. Exactly. You know, when you when you when you think about it, there's only so much land, and man, that's awesome. So, did you have a real estate background at all before? Not you... at all. Not at all. Nope. And do you find that uh, to help you, or is that a hindrance? Well, it, well, I guess when you first got started. Well, I'll tell you a little interview story. Um, I was interviewing with Whitetail and they kind of mentioned, you know, Mike, uh, we're a little concerned you don't have any sales experience. And I kind of stopped them and said, now, wait a minute. I said, don't you consider it to be sales when you're trying to get eight patrolmen to go on the road in 10 degree weather with six inches of snow and <laughs> 10 accidents backed up? I said, isn't that kind of a sales job? And they did exactly what you did. They laughed and they smirked and they look at, looked at each other and said, you know what? <laughs> you know, touche. Yeah, yeah, because when it comes down to it, we're not talking about life and death here. We're talking about getting people on their dream properties. Exactly. All right. Well, let's just exactly. ju- let's just jump right into like the the property aspect of things. And later in the show, I definitely want to get a good hunting story from you. But okay, so I guess the best way to approach this is let's just uh, let's just approach it as if I am a client. And the kind of things uh, you would ask me, the kind of conversations we would have, um, just does it start with a budget? Does it start with an area? I guess just uh, walk me through the the process of what you would do with a new client. I really think I really think it starts with a dream. Okay. You know, and if you have that passion to own land, and it can be for whatever reason, because I deal with all, you know, we tend to really focus on the hunting part, right? Mm -hmm. But it's much, it's actually way deeper than that. I deal with uh, loggers and guys who are looking at the timber. I deal with beekeepers. I deal with people wanting to build a home. I deal with people who just want to own a piece of land because they feel like it's, you know, like you said, they're not making it anymore and they want to own a piece. So I think it starts literally with a dream. And then from there, um, yeah, there's a lot to it. You got to find yourself a budget. You got to find yourself, maybe you want a partner. Um, and you got to find yourself a, a piece that really strikes you and a piece that's right for you. Okay. So let's go on, on the budget thing. Of course, most, okay. most, most people budget it's going to depend location 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 we're talking about real estate here uh but location size of chunk so w- when it comes to whitetail hunting specifically what do you see in your experience as being the minimum amount of like effective acres for someone to start looking at wow that's a tough question because I have guys that have been really successful on as small as 20 acres. Okay. Yeah. That, is, have that doesn't surprise I, me at all. That's, yeah. yeah. And obviously I have guys who have 80 and a hundred who are also very successful. So really this is, this is my opinion and my opinion only mm-hmm. um, for someone wanting land, start with what you can afford. If it's only 10 acres, build yourself the best 10 acres you can build, you know, buy it. Um, improve it as much as possible. And, and maybe you want to talk about that later here, but improve it to the best of your ability. When that gets to be too small, or if it's not cutting it for you, then you can start moving up and, you know, trading in, so to speak, and buying bigger pieces. All right. So I, I think let, let's, let's go with the, the 20 acre example, because I think, okay. I think if, you know, for, you know, a guy from downstate might be looking at 20 acres. You can do a lot with 20 acres with select, you know, hinge cutting and select. You can, 
And on 20 acres, you can establish a bedding area, a feeding area, and uh, transition zones, and also depending on like neighborhoods and like what's around you and whatnot. So I think you can do a lot with 20 acres. So um, we'll, we'll go with that. So if I'm looking at 20 acres, do you guys help with the ideas as far as, oh, yeah, this would be a good transition zone. The, you know, this is what you'd look at for timber or I'd hinge cut this. Do you guys do that or do you just kind of leave it up to the owners themselves? Well, no, every agent's different. Okay. You know, it depends on their level of experience in sales. It just depends on their level of experience in hunting, right? So I really... I don't give my opinions. I don't give my thoughts unless they ask for it because a lot of guys and gals will come to me and they have their own thoughts. And I don't try to, I'm not trying to push them in any manner whatsoever. I want them to hunt in the manner or I want them to own that property in the manner they want to own it. And if they come to me and ask me, then I'll, I'll jump right into it with them on what I think is the best way to, you know, for example, kill larger bucks. Okay. And then, so what makes you with Whitetail Properties different than my Remax agent down the road? Okay, well, I've got a great analogy now that you bring that up. One of the first farms I sold, the buyer came to me, and uh, it was a rainy, really ugly day, and he was sitting there waiting for me. I got out of my pickup truck, and I had a pair of rubber boots up to my knees, and I had a old camel raincoat and a ball cap on. And he looked at me and he really had a weird smile on his face. And I said, is, you know, well, what's so funny? He said, well, he said, you won't believe this, but, uh, the first agent I called showed up in a white Cadillac and a lady got out of the car with high heels on. And I asked her to walk the property and she said, that's not going to happen today. <laughs> so, so I guess we can start there. We, uh, at Whitetail Properties anyways, you're going to run into a, a guy or gal who's extremely passionate about hunting, extremely passionate about farming, food plots, hunting, you know, a whole area of different topics. And they've probably done it or done each one of those things for several, several years. So I've been hunting since 12. No, I haven't experienced the the land sales type, but I grew up farming in northern Michigan. I grew up working on a farm and I have experience in uh, a lot of farming practices, working with dairy, chickens, pigs, haying, all sorts of stuff like that. And feel free to steal this, but I think you are your client. And I think that is a good way to put it. You are, one of, great, you are one of us. That's a great way to put it. I, I really think we are. We're, we're normal, ordinary guys and gals who just have an extreme passion. And we just happen to have the job of doing what you do every day. Right. You said you drive by that property and you dream. That's exactly what we do. Only we get to sell that dream. That's really cool. Do you guys ever just do you guys ever run into people that like want to like put trail cameras everywhere and check out the herd oh. before they buy it? Um, All the time. That's one of the number one things they're looking for is a trail camera picture. Yeah. So for someone selling, that's certainly a great selling incentive. If you can get some trail cam pictures of, uh, the deer and the bucks in your area. Yeah, that's that's really cool. It, what, what do you think? Like, what? Is, obviously, it's going to change on piece to piece. But what is the right. average size property you guys that, that you'd sell? As far as uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm I'm in the thumb area. I would think that my average size piece is right around forty acres. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's affordable to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's. It's no small chunk. It's a nice little size piece of property. And it's, you know, typically that, that probably can hunt really two, three guys if you want. And then you guys are nationwide though, correct? We are nationwide. I think we're in over 31 states now. We're just growing like leaps and bounds. Um, we have over 200 agents in the nation. I know we're moving west now. We're in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Wow. So yeah, we're really moving. So uh, you're going to be moving up into places where there ain't a whole lot of whitetails, brother. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're around there. You know, Montana's not known for whitetails, but they have some excellent whitetail. Oh, yeah. Same with Wyoming. I mean, I remember all those old uh, Realtree road trips. They're always going to Milk River, Montana. 
Right. Shooting them, I've, them big old swamp bucks down there. You yep, know, or I've up, seen some of those up there, I should say. But yeah. All right. So I'm coming to you as a client. Um, okay. What is what is something that most people who are looking for hunt hunting land, what's something they overlook? They don't think about you mention it and they're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Is there anything like that that sticks out? Um, boy, there's a, there's a couple of things I'll give you. I'll try to give you a couple of examples is, uh, I sell a few parcels where the, the piece of ground is either select cut or clear cut. Okay. And that is extremely scary to most every client that I run into. They want, and they do not want anything to do with it, but it makes the hunting what? so much better. <laughs> It's it, it, yes, and it may not be better that year. Right. For example, if something's clear cut last year, I know it looks ugly. Mm-hmm. I know it's not pretty, and it may not even hold a lot of deer that year. But I can guarantee you, in the next five to ten, with the woody brows and the forbs and herbs coming up, it's going to be one of the best hunting parcels in the entire square mile. Absolutely, all that sunlight gets to the ground, and it works its magic. And that's that's kind of a Michigan hunter thing, I think. I think we're so used to in Michigan hunting the big woods of Michigan. They want to see these big trees and these heavily wooded areas when really, as you know, deer just thrive in these little pockets of grasslands or uh, marshland. Yes, they're an edge habitat animal. That's why they thrive around these cities. Yeah, deer's favorite four letter word is edge. The reason I'm so familiar with what you're talking about is we, they, DNR came through and they, they sold, they select cut um our place in west branch and it sucked for a year yeah it sucked for a year it did tops were down everywhere there i mean because especially in state land they don't clean up the tops and they just drop them and but i tell you what ever since then the deer and the bear have been freaking amazing there you go that's exactly what i'm talking about you know i've hunted and been involved in land for 40 years of my life and i had I attended some QDMA classes as a part of my training. I went through level one and two certification and they really, really opened my eyes to it. Yeah, it it really does make a big difference. So that's good. You know, someone's, someone thinks, oh, they have came, they came through here with the chainsaws and the wrecking crew and it's going to be screwed. And that's an opportunity for you to educate them on, on how much better it's going to be. When really Bill, it's, those opportunities are usually a better opportunity. You're able to get it at a reduced price when really I don't see any reduction in the value whatsoever. Other than the lumber, other than the lumber cost. Outside of the lumber cost. Yep. There's, there's definitely timber value loss there, but value in hunting or recreation use, I don't see the loss. And not only that, but we're, is someone going to buy their hunting property? And if they if they view a select cut as negative, they weren't going to select cut it anyway, so they're not at a loss for money. Exactly. So yeah. it's not yep. like they were going to cut them down anyway. But no, that that's a really good way to think about it. Now, you mentioned earlier, guys, people buying in a group. Is there, you know, you always hear like the hunting camps and, you know, the lodges and bylaws and all that. Do you have any like a... Uh, do you do you sell to groups of guys? And if you do, is there any like pitfalls to avoid, or is there any like suggestions to make it go more smoothly? You can think of. That's another great question because I've thought about buying with different friends my entire lifetime, and I've I've put a lot of thought into it. And now, of course, I'm I'm dealing with it directly because I have groups coming to me. Um, so really, in my opinion, again, my only my opinion one of the biggest concerns are going to be how you want to hold title. For example, if you hold title with joint tenancy, which which is a title term, you're going to have a right of survivorship. Meaning if, uh, if that person dies, it's going to be passed on to example, your child or your wife. Right. In another way of uh, holding a tenants in common, for example, it's going to pass on to the group. If you were to pass so you see the difference? You have no right to survivorship under like a tenants in common title. Yeah, you just figure out which which way you want to go with it. You want to figure out which way because, you know, look, in the end, you, you're, you're going to have an asset and you want to pass that asset down to your family someday. And this is the biggest this is the biggest part I think you need to be concerned with. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And I guess there's advantage and disadvantages for going each way. Just get everyone on, on the same page and make sure that that's uh, all filed in the paperwork, right? 
Exactly. If you can get everybody on the same page as far as how the land's going to be treated, how you're going to execute um, improvements, um, then you're going to make a big step forward with it. Now, is that a process you guys handle, or would you like farm that out, tell them to go get their stuff done with a lawyer or something like that? We try to help as much as possible, but I'm really always careful when dealing with things like that, I, I tell them I'm not an expert in the title world. Mm-hmm. World, I want you to go see the title company. You know, just like buying a home, if somebody has an electrical question, I'll say I'm not an electrician. I am not an expert, and I, I definitely will tell them to see seek an expert's help. Yeah, that's pretty dang cool. So, how much territory do you specifically yourself cover? I have uh, eight counties in the thumb, and I'm over. I have Shiawassee and uh, Saginaw, and I go all the way over to Huron, Sanlac, St. Clair. I have Genesee, Macomb, Tuscola, Saginaw, so eight counties. Okay. Yeah. Big area. Oh, yeah, that's a really big area. You consider a county is like 36 miles square usually, oh, yeah. so I, it's, I, you got some driving to do sometimes. I drive a ton. I think I put 40,000 miles on my truck last year. And don't go too far. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a lot of driving in the, the same round area a lot of driving but i i love it i love looking at the country every day that's that's my office and i love it no that that's that's really cool and plus you just have the freedom to not have to necessarily clock in or sit in a cubicle or a patrol car i'm sure for uh good old up north boys like you and me it's a it's a good gig you know i'm retiring in six years i might need to look up whitetail properties <laughs> Uh, you may have to. You never know. We're always hiring. You just may have to move and uh, go to a different, uh, maybe go to a different state or area. Well, you know, we're planning on going to Hawaii. So uh, you know what? We are not out there yet. So you might have a good uh, go. impasse out there. Screw you guys. I'm just gonna start. Uh, what's the little deer that they got out there? I want to start. What is uh, that? Like a- an access? access yeah, access yeah. access properties. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Boy, you're going to go right for the big time, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, we we visit Hawaii quite often. That sounds douchey when you say it that way. But, um, you know, my parents have a timeshare stuff out there. So we've, we've gone oh, nice. quite a few times. And my daughter and my son are in love with it. And uh, she's convinced that she's going to go to the University of Hawaii. And I said, well, I ain't paying for a dorm room in Hawaii. So you can just live with mom and dad out there. <laughs> That's a good plan. That's a good. I like it. Yeah, there's stuff. There's there's a lot of critters out there you can bow hunt. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I hear that. We'll be all right. So all right, very cool. Uh, is there anything about uh, whitetail properties that we didn't touch? I know we've only been talking for twenty minutes, and we could probably talk for hours about it, especially because we're so passionate about it. But I definitely want to uh, find out where to send people if they want to look you guys up. Um, but also, is there any other things that uh, you want to bring up that I didn't mention? Oh, well, like I said, we have the state covered. We have eight different agents throughout the state of Michigan. And really, uh, you can call any one of us and, and we'll direct you to the right agent in your area, whether, whether you're selling or whether you're buying, we'll get you to the right agent. Oh, that's good. Now, so no, no worry there. If, if someone lists their property with like a, a traditional real estate agent, should they still call you to get the property on your radar? Yeah, you? because yeah, we can always we can always it's first of all it's always good for me to know theirs is out there because I have a lot of buyers looking. Right. And if I have a buyer looking for that particular piece of property they have, you know, we can have a connection there. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to think about it. You know, I, I've sold and bought a couple of houses over my lifetime and my buying agents were always great, my selling agents were gone once they got the listing. So, uh No, and I, Bill, I got to tell you, Michigan has one big problem in real estate. We have numerous MLSs and they don't reciprocate to each other all the time. So, I mean, literally, we must have dozens. So the one on the way, if if you're listed in the west side of the state, I may not be able to get into it over here on the east side of the state. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just silly. Yeah. And and other states throughout the nation, I don't know why they can't figure this out, but they have one MLS where everything's listed on the same MLS. All right. So let's say I'm in Michigan, I'm in Nebraska, I'm in Virginia. doesn't matter where, except for Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> let's say I'm, uh, I want to start this journey. Do I go to the Whitetail Properties website and just, is it like a traditional, this is my area code, this is the number of acres I'm looking for, search and look at properties? Is that pretty much how it works? 
Yeah, we have a great search engine. You can pop in what you're looking for. You can call the uh, the company directly, and they'll hook you up with the agent directly because they have a you know they have a schematic there, and they can they can hit you directly to the right agent. Um, so both those ways, you'll be able to find us. Perfect. And what is that website? It's uh, whitetailproperties.com. Well, it doesn't get any easier than that. No, <laughs> yeah. not at all. Pretty easy. Yeah, absolutely awesome. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show, but I'm not going to let you go just yet because uh, I like to say we do a little bit of teaching and a little bit of preaching or switch those two things around, but I also like a little bit of storytelling. And as a, a um, passionate outdoorsman as we both are, I want to pretend like we're sitting around the campfire drinking a soda, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> and um, what's a, if you and I were sitting around the campfire at deer camp, what's a, uh, what's a good old hunting story that you usually like to swap? Wow. I got a lot of good stories. That's the, um, that's the problem when I ask people I this question. I have a lot of good stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They get overwhelmed with, oh, which one? <laughs> I, you know, um, I would like to tell a whitetail story, you know, being I'm with whitetail properties and whatnot. And Michigan is, you know, centered around white whitetails. But I think my best story is a, uh, the tale of my first trip to Alaska and, and my second one. Oh, um, definitely. Let's hear that. I, I, I'm a, I'm a hardworking guy. I was a police officer like you. I worked, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get rich doing that job. So I saved for over two and a half years for my first trip to Alaska. And I went to the Brooks Range to hunt moose and caribou. I called the pilot two days before I left. And when we arrived in Prudhoe Bay, we found out the pilot was dead in the mountains with the sheep on it. <laughs> so we were scrambling to find a new outfitter and a new pilot to get us into our destination. And we sat in a, a mobile home in Prudhoe Bay and froze our tails off for three days. After we finally got to uh, a different location, and after seeing 13 grizzly bear and chasing uh, some caribou around, we finally got to our destination. But they were so worried about freeze up, an early freeze up, that they were really tentative on getting us to the right spot. We ended up going there and we're bow hunting, of course. We're, we go there. We literally only saw one moose and it was probably three miles away. Saw several caribou, never had a shot at them. They kind of keep that, you know, they call it wolf range. Mm-hmm. Those caribou stay about 100 yards away. They'll let you walk right on them, and all of a sudden, 100 yards, they're all gone. So I had a miserable, miserable hunt. Uh, you know, it was like a 7 to 10-day fiasco. Well, I was bound and determined, you know, to, to kind of learn from that. Um, and I went back five years later, and I killed. It's uh, a near Boone and Crockett 16-inch moose on the first day of hunting <sighs> on, my, on my next trip. Did you go to the same area? No, I went to a I went to a different area, and when I went back, I had an A plan, a B plan, a C plan, and a D plan. Literally, I I really did. Yeah, things things you learn. So on that, when you went back, was that a, that was a moose hunt as well? That was strictly a moose hunt. Okay, yep. and then you yep. said uh, you said Boone and Crockett. So you, 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 nearly was, near. Oh, nearly. All right. So yep. bow hunting then or bow hunting, hunting only? Yeah, I've I've only bow hunted about the last twenty five years. So I was bow hunting at the time. That is and, awesome. Uh, for all those guys and guy gals out there, I mean, it can be done. I literally put in like ten dollars in a uh, in a cookie jar. I put in like ten dollars a week and save for two and a half years for those hunts. Yeah, I'm going June 2021 to Alaska. Yep. So hunting. Um, probably fi- it's a family trip, so we'll do some fishing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do something like that. Yeah. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, it can be done. It really can be. People say it's out of reach, and yes, it has gotten more expensive. But I do all my stuff. Do it yourself, and you can do it if you can. If you can really hold your own in the woods with uh, bear deer and elk you can certainly go to alaska and moose hunt yeah that's and that sounds absolutely incredible uh I, i've never seen a moose in person but i've eaten a lot of it and it is one of my favorites oh it, it is amazing just I, amazing i don't know what the difference is if it's because they eat like the wet juicy grass or i don't know but so, so for me personally i'm not a big hamburger guy like a like a cheeseburger guy you know i yeah. mean i, I like at a restaurant or like beef cheeseburgers or even turkey burgers I like. But like 
I don't generally make a venison cheeseburger. It's just not my jam, you know. You know, I don't either. Yeah, I don't either. That's funny. And uh, and it's just, I just think there's better ways to use the meat personally. And um, but the the best burger I've ever had was a moose burger. I was working at Gander Mountain at the time, and the guy had had gotten one, and he brought it in. And I tell you what, I've never had anything as good. I've never had so much flavor in a cheeseburger. <laughs> I tell you what, I, I I agree with you, Bill. That moose is probably the best meat I've ever had. But it helps when you're in the bush and you can only take 60 pounds of gear and you kind of limit your food. When a moose goes down, it is, of course, the best tasting thing. <laughs> yeah, <you're> like, uh, <laughs> you don't have a lot of choice at that point. It's I like, think that's why it's so good. It, uh, it's This is kind of off topic, but, you know... It, there's a scene in um, it's like one of the Lord of the Rings movies where it's like the bad guys are called orcs and they kill an orc and they they start eating them and they're like meats back on the menu boys. <laughs> I imagine it's like yeah, you, you, I remember that you're out there with like four fourteen packs of Mountain House and a jet boil and you're like um yeah we're eating moose. <laughs> That's that's what I'm talking about. I I felt like we ate half that moose, but of course you can't even make a dent into it. No, you know? no, exactly. I mean the back straps alone. Good lord. Yeah, I don't even think we finished the back straps. <laughs> that that's really cool. All right, man. Well, you know we're running up here on a half an hour. That's uh, all the time I wanted to take from your day. I know you're a busy man. You got to get out in the woods there. I really really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to give me a phone call, dude. I appreciate being on. It was fun. Yeah, and hopefully, again, guys, if you are interested in um, looking at buying or selling property uh, or or you're just a dreamer because I've been on Whitetail Properties and I've done the search and see what's available in my area, head over to their website, whitetailproperties.com. Put in your info. Look, see what's available around you. Uh, another good tool is for those of us that like to knock on doors and talk to people. If you see something for sale, uh, you know, and maybe so it, it disappears from sale, there's new owners in the area, you know, that might be an opportunity for you to revisit that property and talk about getting permission out there because you never know. So, uh, again, dude, thanks a lot for coming on the show, whitetailproperties.com. I like to end the show the same way every week, Michael. And I think it's it's a little phrase and I think it's something you're going to agree with and you tell me what you think. I always say, get outdoors. It's a wild place to be, right? Yeah, I love it. All right. I love it. Thanks a lot and we'll catch you guys next week with a brand new episode. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hoffman's Hunting Heritage. Get outdoors. It's a wild place to be. Thank you.